Welcome to the session as we study God's Word tonight. You have joined Pastor Leslie Hessel and uh, I am representing Father's Heart Digital Church tonight. So as the people are coming online, I pray that you will just get ready for a time of just sinking into God's Word and allow His Word to saturate us. I want you to, your hearts and your minds to be like a sponge this evening, just to absorb and draw the, the very power, the very essence, the very anointing out of God's Word so it can empower you and God can use it to change your life. So Father, we just pray tonight that as we come to you, Lord, that Father God, you will illuminate your word. Father God, give us that Raymond knowledge. It not just be Logos. It just not be a written word, Father God, that is dead or a letter that is dead. But Lord, Lord, give it life so it can change the very hearts of men. So Father God, tonight as we are surrendering this time to you, we thank you for your guidance, your leading, and your inspiration in what you do. I submit my all my faculties, all my organs, all everything to you tonight, Lord, to use to glorify your kingdom. So Father God, I pray that even the ears and the and the hearts of the people that are listening is anointed to receive that which is being taught this evening in Jesus' name. Tonight, I've chosen to give this topic or this session the title of Whose Faith Is It? <laughs> Whose Faith Is It? You know, so many times I've been asked by people that come around to say, you know, whose faith is going to heal? So in other words, if they have a healing line and people are laying hands on, on people to be, to receive maybe healing, receive uh, deliverance, be set free, whatever the case may be, as people are praying over them, as men and women are praying over them, whose faith is it that breaks them through and sees the very hand of God move in their life? Who, who, whose faith is it? You know, it's a very interesting question and it's something that, We've studied uh, over the years and looked into, and uh, we formed opinions, and we know and understand what God's Word says, but let me tell you, there's a myriad of reasons why um, certain people don't receive, uh, why things don't happen, but let me not jump ahead of myself, but let's start out by turning to God's Word, and I want you to turn with me, if you've got your Bibles, uh, to Second Kings. And I'm going to go to a very well-known story in chapter 13 of 2 Kings. And I want to read from verse 20. And it says, then Elisha died, okay, and they buried him. And the raiding bands of Moab invaded the land in the spring of the year. So it was as they were burying a man that suddenly they spied a band of raiders and they put the man in the tomb of Elijah, Elisha, sorry. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. Now I want you to picture this, this, um, situation. I want you to, I want to paint you a picture. Let me do it that way. I want you to, to imagine. Okay. Yeah. You've got a man. He was a prophet of God. He lived about 800 years before Christ. And Elisha, the scripture says he had died. So he dies and he gets buried in a tomb. Okay, now he was already dead, historians tell us, about roughly a year already by this time. So here you've got Elisha, he died, buried, he's been buried for, for, for roughly a year. So you can imagine, um, obviously, if you are married, sorry, if you are buried, <laughs> For about a year, and then we understand that they're in tomb sepulchers and all that kind of stuff, and he might have been embalmed. Who knows? Who knows exactly what the detail was? But nevertheless, um, the 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 body would not have been in good shape. Okay, life has already been out of it for twelve months. So yeah, you've got a, a body lying there, dead, dust. Maybe it's just a skeleton left. Who knows? Then suddenly. One night, there are guys who have got another person that they're burying. So they bring this person, but now the Moabites, they were busy tackling, and uh, there were raiders coming along. So yeah, you've got these people in this, in the in the um, uh, graveyard, and uh, yeah, you see lights, and you see people coming, and you're trying to bury somebody, and they're making a racket, okay, and you just want to get out of there. So you're not going to waste time trying to complete the burial process of this individual that you're busy with. And they, they happen to be passing 
um, Elisha's grave, and the the tomb door for obviously must have been open, and they throw the body in. The body happens to touch the skeleton or these bones of a man that's already been dead for a year. And then suddenly, this man comes back to life. Whose faith brought that man back to life? Okay. Obviously, in this case, there was no faith anywhere. It was a dead man on dead bones with people running away. All right. So there was nobody believing God for anything. So what caused that man to then come back to life instantly by just a touch? Now, I think there's a hint in the book of Acts when Paul took cloths, touched it with his, from his body, prayed over it, and then those cloths were sent to whoever needed them. And as those cloths were applied to them, they were healed. You also saw another hint, Jesus, with the woman of issue of blood in Mark chapter 5. You see a story where Jesus is walking. A woman presses through the crowd. She touches the hem of his garment. Virtue flows from him. He, say, he senses that there's actually something that flows from him into the woman. So the woman receives, and by that she then gets healed. So we understand then that there's something else at play here. All right. And we understand that the very tangible anointing of God can be transferred into tactile stuff, cloth, bodies, etc., etc. And we understand that the anointing then can basically remain on something for a period of time without life, normal human life, actually being present. Because in the case of Elisha's bones, life spirit was already gone for 12 months. Yet the tangible presence, the very anointing of God, was still saturating those bones to such a level that they could actually resurrect a corpse. Okay, bring back to life something that just touches those bones. So we have to therefore learn that we are living in a world, I think, where we have not yet fully understand, we don't fully understand, and we haven't fully come to the under, uh, um, realization or even a glimpse of what God has prepared for us in the spirit. Okay. And we, we understand that these physical bodies of ours and uh, everything that you see around about, can actually have the very presence of God in it. And not only something tangible, you know, in the case of Peter, we had a shadow that was actually fell upon somebody. And the mere shadow that came upon them caused a miracle to take place in that individual and that person's life. So yeah, we've got then things that we don't really fully understand. So yeah, we got to then ask ourselves the question, in the case of the corpse that fell upon Elisha's bones, if there was no faith involved, there's also then an anointing okay, that, that brings about the fulfillment of miracles and things like that in individuals' lives. I have seen and experienced the Bible saying they lay hands on the sick and they will recover, and I've seen that happen. I've seen men and women lay hands on those that have been diseased, those that have been sick, those that have been uh, not in a good place, and they have healing has come. Because, yeah, you have another situation or another circumstance. Say, say for argument's sake, somebody has been in an accident, and say they are finding themselves to be near death's door because they've been injured and hurt, whatever the case may be. They've lost consciousness. Now somebody comes and they lay hands on them, pray for them, and God heals them. Obviously, we can come into agreement then that the person that was praying exercised their faith and by touching 
and laying hands on the one that was sick but not conscious and received healing was made whole. All right, so there, there we can therefore say that it's the person who prays, whose faith has made the healing happen or made the miracle happen. But then you have the examples in Scripture also where the individual themselves who have got the need had to exercise and put their faith into action. All right, Jesus himself said, especially about the centurion and also about the, the woman um, who speaks about the breadcrumbs on the, on the table, that both of them, in both their cases, they were Gentiles and both of them came to Jesus needing a miracle in their life. They were in actual fact, both of them didn't personally need the miracles. They were actually believing God for a miracle in someone else, in a servant and in a daughter. So yeah, you've got a situation then whose faith did that, all right, because there it was the individual person who was now believing for somebody else. There was no laying on of hands. They were said Jesus only needed to send his word. That's what the centurion said, and his servant would be healed. Okay, so therefore, we understand then that there is an, there is that dimension where a person's faith that has actually got no, doesn't have the affliction or anything, can be called great faith. Jesus actually in both the cases referred to them as great faith, and he said he hadn't even seen any faith like that in the nation of Israel. That actually brought healing and deliverance to the people that I need. Then you had other individuals again, whereby they had to just stand on the word of God and receive from him. And very often, in most cases in those particular miracles, there was an instruction given to the individuals by either the person that was praying for them, and in Jesus' case, when he was praying for them, and by their obedience to the word of Jesus, they received their miracle, okay? And they did what Jesus commanded them to do, and they received their miracle. The one that comes to mind immediately is the pool of Bethesda. Jesus tells a man, uh, take up your bed and walk, all right? So therefore, the man tried to explain that he couldn't get to the pool because he was sick. And whenever the angel came and stirred the water, he, you know, he was too late and he didn't get his miracle. So Jesus says to him, take your bed and walk. And remember, uh, if I remember the story well enough, um, the, the religious leaders of the day were very not happy because he was healing on a Sabbath. And so you've got a situation here then that that man was healed because of his obedience to a word that was spoken by Jesus. Okay, so I've given you many examples here of how people were healed in Scripture, how they received their miracles. And in many cases, it is the some there was faith involved. Some of them, it's the faith of the person receiving the healing. Some of them, it was the faith of the person praying for the person that is diseased or sick. In some cases, it was just trusting Jesus to send his word and to speak his word. Um, in cases, they were looking for the touch. Um, um, there was a transferal of anointing into uh, tangible objects that they then uh, took to wherever and touched the people. Um, and then, of course, the, the bones of Elisha. All right. So I want, so we basically have many different examples of how Jesus went about and how God went about healing people. So what do we learn from this lot? What do we understand from this lot? Because as I said, the title for tonight has been Whose Faith Is It? Okay. And I want tonight to dare to challenge you. To start believing God to be God. And to understand that it can happen many different ways. And I think the real message I want to bring across to you tonight is do not limit God in what you believe. Let God be God and let him do it whichever way he wants to do it. All you do is just keep your faith established in him. Because we know the well-known well, well known 
passage of scripture that in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 that says that now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And that is basically trusting God and believing God and, and standing on his word that God will be faithful to perform his word and that he will not let us down. We also know that according to Mark 11, which is a well-known scripture about speaking to mountains in verses 22, 23, 24, he says, have faith in God. And then it says, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast in the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says will come to pass, he'll have whatsoever he says. So therefore we understand and know that there is a believing that the, that what you are standing on, the promise you're standing on, the word you're standing on, that that which you're declaring, that confession you're making, will come to pass. That's what faith does. And then in verse 24, it says, When you stand praying, believe that you receive it, and you shall have it. So we know and understand then that we need to, to get to a place where we believe and trust God for what he says he will deliver and what he says he will do. So here we go. We need to come to a place in our lives where we trust God to be God. Irrespective of what the need may be, say for argument's sake, you are trusting God for health. <coughs> Excuse me. You need to know what the word of God says about what God's will for your health is. Now, we know and understand that 1 Peter 2.24 says and declares that by the stripes of Jesus, we are healed. We also understand that in the book of Ephesians, he said he sent his uh, call on the elders and they lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. In the book of Psalms, it says that he sent his word and he healed them. So we, understand, we have no doubt what God's desire is for us in our health condition. He says also that he wants us to be in health, even as our souls prosper. So we need to understand that God wants you to be healthy. Okay. He wants you to be strong physically. We have not the, sorry, the, uh, let me rephrase that. The sickness and disease is not from God. Okay. God does not use or lay, let's put that wrong. He lay, does not lay sickness and disease on his people. Can he use that if it is afflicted upon you? Of course he can. All right, God can do anything. But the th situation is that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above, not sickness and disease. Therefore, we can put our faith in God that he wants us to be healthy and whole. All right, And that we can receive that if we prepare to trust God for it and believe him for it. So we can receive that. So that is the standard that is set and that is what we believe for. So our faith, therefore, is for God to, when we pray for healing, for healing to take place in our body. And that's what we stand on the word and believe God for. As far as um, physical needs are concerned, financial, any other kind of need, physical need, we know that God wants us to prosper. We understand that all our needs are met according to his riches and glory. We understand that the blessing of the Lord maketh rich and he has no sorrow. Um, and I can go on and on. God wants us the same way as he wants you to be healthy. God also wants you to, to, to have more than enough. He wants you to have the provision necessary to live the life that he's purposed and planned for you. Lots of people take that and they, they want to just enrich themselves. The Bible is very clear that if you're going to try and do that, and James makes it very clear, he says that you receive not because you ask not, and when you ask, you ask a miss. So therefore, he says you want to consume it upon your own lust. So you've got to be careful that when you put your faith out there for physical needs and for things that are, that are, are needed in your life, that it is exactly that. Okay, and that you're not wanting to just fulfill your lusts and your desires. Although God again says he'll grant you the, even the wants in your life. So, so we can stand and we can, God does not begrudge us anything. God does not want to withhold anything from us. So again, we can ignite our faith and trust God for his hand to move in our lives as far as provision are concerned. He will provide the clothes that you need. He will provide the food that you need. Even in the Lord's Prayer, it says, give us our daily bread. So we've got absolutely no doubt that God wants 
to meet, God has and does meet the needs of his people. And uh, we, the Bible says, he's never seen, never seen his righteous, the righteous forsaken, nor their seed begging bread. So, so we understand then that we can ignite our faith to do that. Okay, so there I've given you, and I can carry on, and there I've given you examples where the individual, the word of God, challenges us to believe God and actually commands us to believe God for these things in our lives. And we need to walk according to that. So when we do that, God can also move sovereignly. I've seen where God has raised somebody, I know of a, of a testimony where somebody was raised from the dead, where, where it was, it was a sovereign act of God because that person came back to life not because of anybody rather than just God himself, all right, that that person came back. God just basically said it wasn't his time yet. Okay, and he had to come back and fulfill the, the, the call that God had placed upon his life. There was no, no again, no faith really involved by any one individual person. There was, it was a sovereign, sovereign act of God. Now, so... The message tonight is that whose faith is it? Okay. And we have to understand that we serve a God that also makes a statement. He says that he is the author and the finisher of our faith. Your and my responsibility at the end of the day is to study God's word, to get into his word, to know what the word says about circumstances, and situations in our lives, and then be able to stand on that word to see that word fulfilled in our lives and not to back off, not to become slow or wary in trusting God for the fulfillment of his word in our lives. I believe without a shadow of a doubt that once we ignite our faith, that God will move forward and he will start working on behalf of his people. Why do I say that? In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto, unto you. The responsibility there of the believer is to actually just put his faith in God and to seek God, seek his kingdom, seek his righteousness. And when we do that, he is the reward of those who diligently seek him. All right. We see the same thing in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. It says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So there is a seeking that needs to take place by the individual, by the believer, to press into the presence of God. And there is the need that he believes that he exists. You see, if we do not believe that he exists, then you're not going to have the faith to believe that he's even going to reward you, nor are you going to be able to have the faith to believe that God even desires to see things happen in your life. So we need to understand that our responsibility is to press in. Now, when we do that, we'll, sorry, before I go on to the next, next step or next point, Matthew 7 also speaks about the fact that it says, Ask and you shall receive, knock and you shall, uh, the door shall be opened unto you, and seek and you shall find. And in, in some of the translations, that is a continuous repetitive form, which basically means keep on asking, keep on knocking, keep on seeking. So as we do that, we press into the very kingdom of God to see his hand and to see his hand fulfilled in our lives so that our faith can ignite those things and make those things happen. So, let us bring this thing to a head and let's bring it to a landing here. So when you and I come to a place then and we start trusting and believing God, it is our relationship with God coming into a place of, of intimacy with him, understanding who he is and how much he loves and cares for us that allows us to walk into that which he has. But we also have to understand that there's a spiritual or supernatural, let me put it that way, a supernatural manifestation of God himself in our lives. The more that you and I press in and put our faith in God, touch God, intimate with him, develop a relationship, spend quiet time, study his word, meditate on his word, do all the things that, that, that develops intimacy and relationship, 
as we do that, God becomes more real in our lives every single moment of every single day. And he, and by doing that, he becomes, his presence becomes more real in our lives. So, you know, I normally describe it to people this way. The wind, you can't see it, but you can see the, the rustling of the leaves. You can see the paper being fl- blown around the yard, which means that you feel it upon your skin and, but your natural eyes can't, f- can't pick it up unless you look at the, 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 the um, symptoms or that which the wind causes. But the wind itself, you cannot see. When you and I press into the very presence of God and we allow ourselves to spend time with Him, and we become intimate with Him, and we focus on Him. He comes. There's absolutely no doubt about it. He comes, all right? Sometimes you might not feel it. Sometimes you will feel it, all right? Nevertheless, He comes. And when He comes, He is with you, all right? And He's even in you. And as He does that, His presence starts manifesting in your physical body. Your body is, I like to describe it this way, it's like a sponge or like that it will suck up water or it's like a battery that sucks up electrical charge. Your mortal body, my mortal body, we can actually allow the Holy Spirit to to charge these bodies, to use a sponge and allow the very presence and power of God to saturate these bodies so that, so that we can actually see the manifestation of His presence and power as we go about life. It's in that circumstance that we can then be like a, a Peter where our shadow falls on somebody. We can be like a Paul where we touch a cloth and we pass a cloth on. We can be like Jesus where our, the very hem of our garments, um, if it's touched with a touch of faith, can see the very virtue and power of God move from one vessel to another vessel and virtue power will flow and it will be separate. So, we need to understand that we as believers need to pursue a supernatural relationship with our Father. We need to allow Him to come by His presence and power to, to touch our bodies. And like Elisha, as more time we spend with God, the more our bones will suck up the very anointing of God, the very power of God. We know in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the Bible tells us that we'll receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon us. So we understand that even as we press in and we touch the hem, we touch the, the garment of Jesus, and we press in and we read the word, study the word, spend time with Jesus, that we will experience that very presence power upon us. So I believe that in these last days where we find ourselves now, that we're going to see more and more of this. We're going to start seeing how God, through His people, meet the needs of others not only in a in a natural way, but in a supernatural way. And there's more and more evidence of that every single day. So I want to encourage you, press in. Press into the very presence of God. Whose faith is it? It really is exactly irrelevant. We need to all trust God. When we come into agreement, there's another powerful dynamic in the spirit realm, and that is that the Bible says one can put a thousand to flood, two can put ten thousand to flood. When we join and come into agreement, our, the very power intensifies in the lives of a believer, and we can achieve a lot more. So therefore, I want to encourage you, pursue the supernatural. Pursue a relationship with the Almighty God that's intimate, that is intense, that is powerful, and encounter the Holy Spirit for yourself. Invite Him to be part of your life. Communicate with Him. Speak to Him. Pray to the Father. Allow Him, through the Holy Spirit, to speak back and pray and communicate with you. Then be obedient to the instruction of the Father. and See the hand of God move. And you will become a vessel that God will use where imagine that if your body was so loaded with the presence and power of God that one year after you've died, people come across your bones, they still get healed. That is amazing. That is, as some, I heard some people say, cool. <laughs> that is very cool. 
And we can receive that and we can know that in Jesus' name. So I want to encourage you tonight. Pursue God. Trust Him. He will encounter you at your point of need in whichever way is necessary for you to receive what is needed in your life. Whether it be physical, whether it be financial, whether it be spiritual, whether it be emotional, whether it be whatever, doesn't matter. So let's just pray. I want you, if you've got a need tonight, just stretch your hand out to the screen right now. And let's just believe God together for your need to be met in Jesus' name. So Father, we just come to you right now. There are many people out there watching, Lord. They've heard about a supernatural God. They've heard about an anointing that can break the yoke of bondage. Father God, they've heard about a God who loves them and cares about them. And Father God, tonight I pray that you'll supernaturally encounter your people. Father, there are people out there right now that might have financial needs. There are people out there that right now might need a physical touch in their body. They need healing. There might be people that are mentally oppressed, Father God, and that are right now need a miracle in their mind. There might be people that are being harassed and attacked by satanic forces and demonic influences, Father. We bind those things and we cast them down in Jesus' name and set those people free. So, Father God, we thank you right now for a flow of your spirit, even right now through the, the, the airwaves of the social media, through the internet, through television, through whichever me medium it doesn't really matter. But Father, you said you sent your word and you healed them. You delivered them, Father. And Lord, that's exactly what we're believing for right now. So Father God, I thank you that wherever people might find them, encounter them at their point in need. Father God, I pray for those needs met in Jesus' name right now. So Father God, we give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise for everything that you're doing and accomplishing in Jesus' name. May the Lord richly bless you. Stand on his word. Trust him. Let faith be your evidence, okay, of God's love in your life. May the Lord richly bless you. Amen.